Are you listening? I am about to or I am going to die. Either expression is correct. Words of Dom Dominic Bohar's uh, famous French uh, Grammian. You have probably been in uh, churches when the pastor is there for his last Sunday. He is retiring or resigning or being retired or resigned and it is his last opportunity to preach. If you have ever heard one of those sermons, perhaps you said, well, if he had uh, preached he, this way of uh, uh, all the time, we would have kept him. Pastors let it all out uh, on uh, those last Sundays. All the things uh, that they have always wanted to say, always felt led to say, but were afraid to say, they finally say, and off they go. Last words are powerful and often become famous. Jesus' last word to his disciples during the Last Supper are what many theologians call the farewell discourse. Jesus holds nothing back, not that he was ever in the practice of doing so. He makes it very clear what he wants his disciples to know and to remember. Those words transcend uh, time and distance uh, to speak to us today. Love, obedience, truth, fear, loneliness, all important issues we wrestle with, uh, with as uh, we discover who we are in Christ. Jesus speaks clearly about these things. Are we listening? I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said. Hallelujah, amen. Dear God, as the noise and pressure of earthly life presses in on my soul, give me the willingness and the ability to be still and know that you are my God, that you are my uh, counselor and my comforter. I want to engage with your living word, even some of those dusty verses I heard so long ago. May your words be the meditation of my heart as I live as one who is free. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Letting Jesus' love flow through you. Why not? After all, all it belongs to him. Last word of comedian Charlie Chaplin in response to a priest who was reading him his last uh, rites and said, May the Lord have mercy on your soul. As Jesus reclined with his disciples during the Passover, his last words to them were pointed and clear. A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you so you must love one another by this everyone will know that you are my disciples a new command only hours before his death yes christ is just about to usher in the new covenant a fulfillment of all the law and the prophets yet a 180 degree shift in the direction of human spirituality. Man-made religion and legalism would soon be nullified by the sacrificial death of Jesus because God so loved the world. Love is the new standard, but this new command is it just a new thing we must do, a new burden to carry, not if you look at the context and Jesus' prayer that follows. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. 
At a very end of this course, Jesus says that it will be his love in us that will distinguish us as his disciples. He is in you. He is his love that fulfills this new command to love others. God of love, the Son showed me the Father's love on the cross. By the Spirit, stir up the genuine love for you that you created within me. I do love you. Your love is real and you have placed it in me. Let it flow, Jesus. This is beyond me, yet I ask that you make it real in my heart and mind today. Amen, hallelujah, amen. There is an inbred attitude we all have that can destroy marriage. It's subtle, but it's deadly. The attitude is this, inside my circle, in my church. It actually goes all the way back to when God created angels. One day, one of them though, wow, in spectacular. In fact, I am so impressive that I think I could run this place. That angel was cast out of heaven, but ever since then, he is being trying to convince people that they could be in charge too. One day in the garden of Eden, Eve said to Adam, God said, if we eat this, we will have all the knowledge of good and evil. If we eat this, we could run this place. There were dire consequences to that choice. God said to Eve, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. The word desire means the desire to control. In other words, you will try to control this relationship and your husband will try to control you. Now, so now, we have Eve, the queen of her domain, and Adam, Adam, the king of his domain, two people and two circles. The desire for control continues in us. The whole time we are growing up, we are trying to establish our circle because inside our kingdom circle, we are in charge, we are in control. Then one day marriage happens and on the wedding day, it's a clash of the clans, two kingdoms colliding. So we try to negotiate a man merger or more accurately, we try to bring the other person into our kingdom. Can you see how these inbred attitudes of control can destroy a marriage before it ever gets started? If you look behind the conflict in any marriage, chances are you will find a king or a queen or both protecting their circle. If you are still trying to merge two kingdoms, your marriage has not yet taken flight. In Matthew 12, part 25, Jesus said, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. Controlling your personal kingdom and having a great marriage are incompatible. You have to choose, will I build my personal kingdom or will I build a great marriage? If you want a great marriage, then you both must arise your own circle and together embrace God's. His kingdom is about worshiping the Lord and serving Him. It's about aligning your life around what He wants and being available to live for Him instead for yourself. That's when your marriage will really take off. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Pardon me, sir, 
I did not do it on purpose. Last words of French Queen Mary Antoinette. She had accidentally stepped on the foot of her executioner on her way to the guillotine. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his time was up. In a few short hours, he would leave the world and go to his father. There was no question about his love for the men he was sharing. His last meal with the next day, he would prove his love for the whole world. They had moved beyond the awkwardness from earlier in the meal but for those closest to him the words of his pen, uh, pending departure caused confusion and concern as part of his farewell discourse jesus offered them word words of comfort and I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever the spirit of truth the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you help was on the way an advocate a counselor the spirit of truth the prepositions christ used are revealing this spirit had been with them soon he would be in them this is no small distinction no, uh, not for them, not for us. This Holy Spirit of God is not just around us, not just among us. He is in us. If you have opened the door of your life to Christ, He is in you. The movement of farewell discourse is profound from with us to in us. Of all the famous last words spoken, are not these perhaps the most important we could hear his final words telling us who we are because of who is in us holy spirit let me never never get over the wonder and awe of who i am in christ and who you are in me give me the peace to ponder this the passion to envision it, the faith to live out the truth that you endeavor me. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. When things go from bad to worse, I can't sleep. He could see it in their eyes. They were starting to get scared. This was not some sort of parable or illustration. This was for real. Jesus was telling them of his impending death and departure. And Judas has already left the group destined to set in motion the events that would climax in his innocent blood being shed. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were, were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Jesus knew that over the next hours, days, months, and years, his disciples would have to learn how to trust and believe him. He knew that in centuries to come, we would need to learn the same. In his final discourse to the disciples and his future encouragement to us, his teachings were twofold the spirit will be in you on earth and i will come back for you one day trust me 
I have it all figured out. Jesus, what can I do but praise you for your provision? You have given me everything and the only thing I truly need on earth, your spirit in me. I trust and believe in you even when circumstances on earth go from bad to worse. I trust and believe in you and on the other side, I trust and believe that you will be coming back to take me to a place prepared for me. I trust and believe. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Identifying with Christ. We cannot close our eyes to the reality of suffering for it is the reality chosen by the one we name the Lord and Christ. And the path he walks here is the one he bids us to follow. If you are like me, you sometimes dream of a God who gallops into the sand on his white stallion, takes care of all the bad guys, and then rides off into the eternal sunset with everybody in town saying wow who was that mysterious god and then in my dream everybody is knocking down my door begging me to share the gospel with them in, uh, so that they can have he, this god on their team too it doesn't appear to work that way bad guys come in many forms today and bad guys bring suffering of many kinds it might be physical emotional or even a spiritual and no jesus doesn't scare them all away suffering was his reality suffering is our reality therefore since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we uh, profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weak, uh, weaknesses. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I think God may even allow suffering to gently move us toward Jesus so that we can identify with him. That is, that's a deep thought and it's definitely worth thinking about as we celebrate Easter. Our suffering is a shared experience with Jesus, something that can bring deeper intimacy in our relationship with him. He may not re rescue us the way that we wish, but in his goodness, I believe he offers some things far more valuable. He invites us to approach the throne of grace and receive mercy. He is really offering himself to us, welcoming us into intimacy through shared suffering. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to the Jesus. Dear Jesus, I ask you to open my heart and my mind. Use my suffering to help me more closely identify with your suffering so that we can share these experiences in unity. I do need your mercy and grace in my time of need. I thank you for becoming a human so that you can sympathize with my struggles. Thank you that I can enter into your presence with confidence because of what you have done for me on the cross. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. His pain your gain. 
We have so authorized, authorized the passion and death of this sacred man that we no longer see the slow unraveling of his tissue, the spread of gangrene, his raging thirst. The image in the movie The Passion of the Christ stunned us all. After decades of this uh, thing, the meaning of the cross, some of us had become desensitized uh, to the fact that the crucifixion was all, true, all too real that day in Jerusalem, real wipes, real nails. Scar scarlet blood, steaming sweet, bitter tears, real suffering. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished, uh, punished by God, sticking by him and uh, afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was cr uh, crushed for our in equality. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and execution as quite a matter of fact. His uh, historians and Hollywood have willingly filled in the graphic descriptions prior to the cross. Jesus knew the normal demands and limitations of the human body. We don't have an indication that he got sick, but he may have. We do see plenty of hunger, thirst, and being physically tired. He definitely understands physical suffering. He certainly sympathized with our physical suffering the important thing is that jesus is here and jesus cares and he did something about it lord jesus isaiah predicted that you would carry my sorrows and take up my infirmities so I leave them with you now. Thank you for the peace that was brought through your punishment and the healing that I can now I can know through your wounds. I claim that now through faith in you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Beyond symbolism, to the abundant child wailing in the city street, the mother weeping over her stillborn infant, the man mourning in the tor uh, torture cell, the parent will no food or medicine to give a dying child, the Indian hunted uh, down by rancher's dog, the one betrayed by a friend, to all the wounded and suffering this despised and dishonored the gospel points to jesus and says hold your suffering behold your god just before the last supper the night before his death jesus needed to make a point to his disciples you need to be sacrificed servants so he took out the cloud and the wash basin and washed the grimy foot of his followers it was powerfully symbolic, a real attention getter. The haymaker that made his lecture a knockout. Washing feet? Yes, it was the perfect conclusion to the message that he was communicating to his somewhat rem uh, remedial disciples. Now that I your Lord and teacher have washed your feet. You also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. No, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. They 
got the message the sermon was over or was it what if the food washing wasn't just a lesson illustration what if Christ's uh, actions weren't just symbolic what if the food washing was authentic an extension of who Jesus really is I worry sometimes that Christian faith has become too theoretical and not enough actual. Jane Christ's suffering and our suffering are a shared experience. His sacrification service to us has, uh, has cost him his life. Our sacrification service to each other and the world is also costly, but it is the real deal, and suffering as, serf, as servants brings about a freedom because it's actually an extension of who we really are in him. Dear Jesus, I don't want to live in that theoretical Lord, I believe that I am in you and that you are in me. Live through me today as a uh, sacrificial servant in a practical way. May this be another experience that we can share together that will add unity to our relationship as we love the world together. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen.